Thank you. Um, yeah, so we're a bit uh, before schedule, but I guess everyone is ready for lunch, uh, so that's okay. Um, ready to talk about cash? Or listen, in your case, maybe. Um, so yeah, a bit of background, but before we go into that, uh, who here actually uses Symfony Cash today? And um, anyone attended talks around that or uh, anything like that? Okay. Uses anyone using FOSS HTTP cache? FOSS HTTP cache? That's uh, the HTTP cache stuff, extended version. Okay, if you're interested in Varnish and how to also plug into that, there's tons of talks from me and others online if you're also want to dig into that. But uh, regarding Symfony Cache, a bit of background why e what, where EC fits into this. We'll uh, also talk about Symfony Cache, of course. Cache tagging we'll also talk about, the theory around it, and also a bit how it's stored within Symfony Cache. We'll uh, just go briefly on Memcache versus Redis, because I guess a lot of people here might have used Memcache, but not Redis, or the opposite way. Uh, briefly on Redis and Cluster. There's uh, things to know about there. Uh, new adapters that came in Symfony 4.3 and also being improved in 4.4. Uh, in practice with Symfony Demo, see if we can make that uh, cached. And also look at the uh, structures with uh, Redis CLI, the command from Redis. And if we have time, we'll talk a bit about edge cases to be aware of when caching. There, there are some. Um, me, uh, actually, I don't actually have a degree in um, engineering or anything. I come from economics, uh, but uh, this was chosen during around 2000 when it didn't look so prosperous to work in engineering. So uh, my hobby was all the time from 15 years and today uh, programming. So that's uh, where I ended up uh, working. So I ended up working in um, Easy systems a uh, long time ago, like 13 years ago. Uh, we are um, uh, global across several countries, mostly focusing on Europe right now, uh, but we also have offices uh, in New York um, and yeah, other places. What we make is, most of you might have heard Easy Publish, what we make today is Easy Platform, which is a newer version of that. It's still an open source CMS feature, it's flexible, and been on Symfony since 2012, which uh, brings me here. So we ori originally used something called Stash, a different library, but in 2017 we moved over to Symfony Cache, uh, worked a bit with uh, Niklas Grekas, the guy behind it, um, and then got them to add something called uh, cache tagging. We'll return a bit on why uh, later. Uh, since then, we have contributed uh, and helped together with others in the community to um, improve that component, especially when it comes to Redis. And specifically, since Spring's Spring, we shipped with our own um, optimized uh, tag over adapters for Redis and file system and also contributed those to Symfony. So, let's jump into some theory. Symfony cache. Since not so many of you have used it, it's good to go over the basics of what it is. Um, it's a PSR6, so the standard within PHP community uh, cache component. It also supports PSR16, which is uh, another standard, but that's not so important here. Uh, it aims to be fast compared to others. Uh, that's about at least the aim, so it tries to when you ask for several things, several keys, it will try to make sure that goes over one call to the backend, for instance, and stuff like that. Um, the component itself is also uh, um, progressively being used throughout Symfony. So these are some of the places might show up in HTTP cache as well at someday. Uh, it does have a lot of adapters. Um, it can be used with APCU, or what we called APC before, uh, array, so in memory and PHP. Uh, chaining, combining several adapters. Doctrine, which is in itself has 
or Doctrine Cache, which is itself has a lot of adapters that you can plug in. Uh, file system, uh, proxy, Redis, Memcache, and Tagaware. So when talking about Tagaware, we might have to go a bit into what is tags. Uh, we have basically in our case, so we have a CMS. Um, we have a lot of secondary indexes on our entities. So in our case, uh, our content could have a type ID. It could have a section ID, location in our case, because we're tree-based, uh, and paths. So we can try to invalidate on these different things when something happens. Especially specifically when something happens on a bulk of them. So when we need to do an operation on all, <coughs> we use this to do invali invalidation. Um, so to cache entities, or the result of them, we want this kind of secondary index also in the cache. So in this case, might be the key might be uh, content with ID, and we need to apply some tags to that. For instance, the type 2, which in our system would be a folder. Or, yeah. Specifically how this is done, or if we jump into the code, if you ever used any of the um, cache pools from PSR or something like this, this is actually everything it adds, kind of. Uh, from the pool side, at least, that's the method that is added. So you have an invalidate tags, but what it implies is a secondary index. So a lookup to be able to figure out which cache case is related to which uh, tags. Going into a bit practice here, um, the adapter itself wraps your normal adapter. So if you have Redis adapter, it will wrap that. If you have file system adapter, it will wrap that. And it just stores the tags in a separate key. So you have the cache you are saving, and then the tags. And on top of that, it needs to have uh, expiry. So what you're actually seeing here is when you ask for, this is page index as a key, it would also ask for the tags for that one. This will return a bunch of tags in this case, which is then secondly done on a separate lookup to get if they're invalidated or not. These are actually just Unix timestamps. So when these are invalidated, they will have a date. It will know that this is expired. So that's the um, algorithm or <laughs> setup of a uh, tagover adapter. We'll um, come back to the uh, improved adapters or the alternative adapters a bit later. Um, now we jump a bit to memcache versus Redis and then talk a bit about Redis before we go into the details of the new adapter. Talking about memcache versus Redis, um, who here has used memcache? Yeah, so most people have used that. It's been around for a long time and Redis came later. Um, some people, people that use Redis can sometimes say that Redis is so much better, so much faster, but actually the answer is more depends. Memcache can be better at some things as well. Uh, what Redis has here as, is that it has a lot more features. It's more like a data store. It allows you to have a lot of more data types. It's not just string. It allows you to control when um, the cache is evicted. So when, when it starts to hit memory thresholds, memory limits, it, uh, you can define how it should behave in that case. Not so much with memcache. It allows you to persist to disk. So you can use it as a database if you want. Uh, you can pipeline several, <coughs> several commands in one go. So if you want to do several operation towards the cache, you can do it in one operation. Uh, it's not out of the box multi server, but you can use something called Redis cluster to solve that, or Redis Sentinel if you only want master slave. Um, it's not multi threaded like memcache. Um, that is something you need to handle with Redis cluster to, to basically set up several processes to uh, shard the, the, the cache and also handle and more load. 
Uh, they're fixing that a little bit in Redis 6 uh, by introducing a, a slow background thread for everything you do that might be slow, but besides that, it's still uh, by design single threaded. So if we were to try to simplify this uh, gravely, too much maybe, uh, one of them is a massive concurrent multi-threaded simple key value store that can make advantage of lots of CPU cores case across a lot of servers. So that's memcache. Um, Redis, however, is more of a very advanced data store, lots of data types, sophi sophisticated operations that I will show you in a bit, but single-threaded. So in that case, you need to use this Redis cluster to scale it up. So talking about Redis and Redis cluster, let's maybe dig a bit into that. First on Redis, uh, I talked about re data types. Um, it's worth mentioning them. You have the strings, you have lists, you have sets. We'll come back to sets in a bit with more details. We have sorted sets, hashes, bitmaps, hyperlog logs. <laughs> Don't ask me what it is, I haven't used it. But it's um, uh, streams, uh, very advanced. Uh, there was actually a talk at Symphony Live Berlin on this, so if you're interested in that, um, find it online. It's a topic in itself. Uh, there, well, it's probably out of date now, but when I counted, there was like 227 commands that you could do to, to Redis on these different data types. Some are generic, uh, some are for clusters, some are for connection and pub sub and scripting and transactions, but the rest are for data types. Uh, for string, for instance, even there, it goes far beyond what you have on memcache. You have also like append, bit, post, decrement, um, and specifically, as we will return to set a few times here, we can go through some of the um, commands you can do on a set. So set is a, a set of values. It uh, also makes sure that um, there's only unique values. So when you add a value, Redis will make sure that if it's already there, it won't be added again. So on this, you can add members to the set, you can remove members to the set, and you can pop uh, members out of the set. You can also do um, do scar diff inter union, so you can union several sets. Uh, you can move <coughs> members from one set to another. You can also scan the members or do a scan on the na with um, <laughs> pattern for the names of the values you have within that. So you can do a lot of advanced stuff. So that's a bit on <laughs> commands. I hope you see that you can do a lot with Redis, and it's not really a um, key value store like memcache. Um, I talked also earlier about eviction. Um, so in um, memcache, you have mostly LRU, so uh, last recently used. Um, yeah. Uh, but in, uh, evic in um, Redis, you can either set it to not evict anything, you can force it to only evict things that have a TTL. So that's the first here. Or you can also ask it to do it across all the data members you have. Um, because in Redis, you can also give, you can store something without a TTL. So you say to Redis, store this, but don't ever expire it. And if you configured Redis with one of these, it will never be expired. However, if you configure with this, it might be expired if it's not recently used, or randomly hit, <laughs> or uh, least frequently used. So that's basically keeping count of how many times a key has been used. And this is only timestamp of when it was used last, and then figured out um, that those that haven't been used in a while will be cleared. And the last one, TTL, yeah following the TTL. So that th those that are closest to being expired will be the deleted first, instead of those that have expired in the future. So that's some of the futures of Redis. Uh, let's move on to Redis uh, cluster. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, it allows you to scale up Redis by running several instances. Uh, you can have those processes on the, on the same server if you have a lot of CPUs that you want to take more advantage of, uh, or cores, or across several servers. 
um, I guess most of us, at least for web cases, we tend to use extra capacity in our web servers and have one instance of uh, memcache or, or Redis running on that web server as well. Um, but in other scenarios, you might do it completely different. Um, the cluster coordinates the cache across what it calls cache lots. It also coordinates it across, across um, masters and slaves, in plural. So it makes sure that um, the data is uh, kind of backed up. So it, it's uh, stored several places in case one of the nodes goes down. Uh, typically, you only read and write from masters unless you know you can read from uh, the slave, which might be out of sync. Um, and that's kind of how you deal with it. Uh, unlike memocache, several of the operations I mentioned earlier has some limitations with this. Um, you'll have, um, and talking about limitations, you can have something called um, arrow cross slot keys in request don't hash to the same slot. So this basically means if you do an operation on several keys and some of those are not in the same node, it will not allow you. Uh, so that's why it doesn't support the pipelining future, for instance, with cluster. Um, most of these limitations are in the client because the clients can try to fix this. They can figure out where the keys goes and do it for you, so don't, you don't have to deal with it. And I, exactly that it does for something called multi-get and multi-set. So if you give it several keys, it will figure out where those needs to go and do the request to the node where those keys are. But beyond that, it doesn't necessarily do that for all of the other operations. So some examples of affected operations. Uh, rename, for instance, won't work if the new key you rename to uh, will be on a different node. Uh, eval, uh, which is a way to do scripts on Redis. So you can run scripts on Redis and then return the results. Can only be run <laughs> if the keys you give it is on the same node, for instance. So that's uh, unfortunately things you need to take think about if you want to use Redis as advanced as that. If you only use it for a simple value, key value store, you won't be hit by any of these issues because mget, mset, all the normal uh, set and get operations are covered. Um, so I've been kind of building up to this because those are the issues I talked about we, we ran into <laughs> when we implemented this stuff. So in um, Symfony 4.3, we have the new Tiger uh, Tiger adapters. Um, some kind, sometimes we call them native because they're not wrapping another adapter. It, it uh, does it natively with uh, whatever it is. So jumping into that, uh, moves basically the tags to be a relation instead. So instead of using the expiry time that you saw earlier being done as a second lookup to figure out if the cache has been expired, it stores a relation so that it doesn't have to do the extra lookup. So it doesn't have to do two lookups, it can just do one. Instead, it does this lookup on invalidation. So it uses that relational information to figure out what needs to be invalidated when it invalidates something. So for file system uh, in 4.3, that was a uh, symlink. Uh, Nicholas Grekas changed this now to a flat file, I think. He might um, work further on it before 4.4, but that's at least the current state um, to try to fix issues with running Windows, for instance. Um, on Redis side, we use the set, so the, the data type I talked about earlier. Uh, and we set it, at least for now, without an expiry. So we make sure that this tag information is never removed. Um, and then we uh, have documented that you need to set the correct expiry time um, settings to enable this. So that's kind of it um, on the high level. On the cache itself, we actually force it to be uh, expired in couple of weeks, so we make sure it's recycled if needed. Um, but for now, that's the setup of it. Nicholas is actually working a bit on this and trying to improve it further. And we might see some further improvements also on that in 4.4. So why the effort on this? Uh, why are we trying to do uh, like 
one um, round trip to the backend uh, to, to get the data. So a bit of uh, background to this. For instance, if you run um, Amazon, you run Elastic Cache, there is uh, notable latency when you need to, to go to another server. And in Amazon case, it's definitely on another server. Even if you have a cluster, you would most likely have also another server uh, if you set up your own cluster. So in best case scenario, you have like a um, latency of 0 0.2, 0 0.5. On micro small instance, uh, I heard a uh, lot higher numbers, but um, that was might be a special case. Um, so what this means is that when, for instance, our application starts up and it has a call cache, no cache at all, um, a simple page uh, could, for instance, do 40 lookups. Um, so in, not in our case, that's more like a demo example with Symfony. Then you might have 20 lookups, maybe. And that that is not so bad. 5 to 20 milliseconds is roughly what it accounts for, plus the comp computing on this and the PHP runtime on, on this. But uh, just for the wait time, adds up to roughly this. But in our case, in the CMS, where we have maybe a huge landing page for yeah, some media company, some website, uh, news website, there might be uh, a lot of different things going on. So there might be 100 content uh, items in our case. And, and that, again, adds up to like 2,000 lookups to, to, to Redis or Memcache, which starts to be quite a lot of time. So this is not even... This is not even when things are cold. This is for all the, the lookups. So actually, this is just the traffic going back and forth to the back end. So in theory, we wanted to see if we can reduce that. Uh, in our case, we focused on the, um, the adapters we talked about uh, earlier. And we also do done a lot of other things uh, to try to optimize it. So basically, to go a bit about over the optimizations done in Symfony in the last year, um, actually, some of the numbers you saw on the previous slide uh, account for the fact that there were some flaws in Symfony Cache. So if you used Redis cluster, it would try to do a no singular get in a pipeline instead of doing an mget. So basically, it was doing, if, you, if I was asking for 10 keys, on Redis cluster, we'd have to do 10 lookups. Um, just changing that to multi-get suddenly got it as that back to down, to one. There was also uh, an issue with the Redis cluster where it was versioning the whole cache. So if you needed to clear everything, it was keeping count of a version number. So just incrementing from one to two and two to three and so on. And needed to look up this version all the time to know which version you're on. So that was also improved. Actually, it was fixed by Niklas in 4.4, backported to 4.3, and yeah. Uh, Niklas Grekas also improved the tag over adapter to add some TTL cache for the tag lookups because they don't of often update. On our side, on application, we took um, imp uh, exposed a lot of multi um, load uh, operations in our API to be able to take advantage of the things in Symfony to do multi get. On top of that, we also uh, optimized uh, the, the Redis adapter. And in our case, we also introduced um, in-memory cache, so basically caching stuff in PHP memory when we see we can have burst cache of like 10 items that we see are frequently uh, loaded. We, we add that in memory and keep that around for 100 milliseconds maybe, because we know that's pretty safe on some entities. Uh, so that might be something we will contribute to Symfony as well, but it's in the current state, it's very, very application specific. Uh, so in our case, we went from, with all this optimization, from like 17,000 lookups with Redis cluster down to 63. So it was way more than the two seconds I had on the previous slide. It was like, yeah, if you had a lot of latency on Redis, I had clients waiting 60 seconds to load a page, so... Um, it adds up. Um, so 
that was it on uh, theory. Let's see it from a different angle. Let's jump into demo. So in this case, I don't know if you're aware of Symphony Demo, but it's, um, it's a demo on top of Symphony uh, Flex. It tries to show you um, uh, a blog. I'll show it to you in a second. But um, So what we will do, we'll try to cache those uh, posts that is uh, displaying. We will uh, go into the admin and try to edit something. Uh, we will have to <laughs> clear cache because it's not clearing it. Then we'll need to add the um, invalidation in admin. And secondly, we will also try to look at things from Redis perspective. We'll use Redis CLI and Playwright to try to emul emulate what Symfony is doing. So I'll need to switch screen here now. So, I talked about the Symfony demo application, and it's um, this is it. Uh, you when you enter it, I need to start the server. When you enter it, you are given the choice of either going to admin or or front end. So it has both. It has login um, of users. It has listing of posts. On those posts, it has comments. Uh, it has um, uh, content tagging or, or blog post tagging or um, cate categories. Uh, and it has the back end, as I mentioned, which you, where you can edit, you can create new posts, and so on. So a small demo application showing how you can do things, trying to be showing best practice. Um, so what we what I've done here, I've just checked out Symphony Demo, uh, latest version one four four, um, and I um, started to do some changes. So if we see, specifically what I've done, um, yeah. So initial checkout, just with the um, changes that uh, Flex did for me out of the box. Added Symphony Cache um, as an explicit dependency. It was there, but just to add it, uh, because now I'm going to use it. So not really a step in itself. But So the real first step, add front-end caching on the, um, something called the blog controller. And then add uh, cache clearing on the admin controller. And lastly, switch to Redis backend. So the first step, add frontend to cache caching. So we can see we have done some uh, modification on blog controller. Can try to open that. And I'll, of course, need to increase the font. So we saw in the diff oops, that we added uh, a couple of classes there. The most important thing is this one. Uh, all the other things are details in to be able to showcase the demo. <laughs> so we added the TagAware uh, interface from Symphony Contracts. Uh, in Symphony, this has been set up to out of R to the correct um, uh, service. So we use that. That's maybe a bit too big. Is it okay if I take it a bit smaller? Okay, yeah. So there's a couple of methods there, so the, the actions. 
uh, we have the index section where we basically just added Tagaware interface and now Tagaware takes care of the, the rest as usual. Uh, I'll return to the commented out code there in a bit. First, um, we are using the PSR6 interface plus the tagging. Uh, so this is the, the standard way, it's the way, the way I kind of prefer. Um, we check if uh, we get the item, we give it a name, we take into account which page you're on, if there's a tag, so basically um, Symphony Demo allows you to filter based on tag if, you clicked, if we clicked in the demo. On one of these, it should filter on the, the tags that are within that. So for the, um, the cache lookup, we need to take all of this into account to make sure it's unique. So the key is unique. We check if it's a hit or not. If it's not a hit, we need to do all the work behind the scenes. We need to do whatever the, the controller actually did before. And we need to, um, well, we'll return to later, but we need to also tag those. So we're able to clear a lot of them. Because this is basically a uh, um, page where l there's a lot of variations of this page. There's the page uh, pager, the <laughs> num page number that can increase. And it's also the tags it can filter on. So if we didn't have tags and we needed to clear by keys, uh, the admin code would look quite ugly. Or we would need to do some funky uh, Redis uh, logic with maybe some uh, S scan, which I mentioned earlier. So you can do like a scan on with uh, regex and so on. But instead here we use a uh, tag to tag it with a unique ID for this controller or this data set so that we can clear it. Um, I'll return to what kind of tags when we go into admin. Then we just set uh, the values, we save it, and if it was a hit, we get it, or just read it. So that's it uh, on, on this side. So if we, um, if we have a look here, We can see now, um, well, I guess you didn't see it, but there was four uh, SQL lookups. Now there is one. The reason why there is one is that I'm logged in and it's doing lookup on the user. Otherwise, it would be zero. The rest is done to cache. Um, currently, 62 cache lookups. Some of them are not done by us. Those are done by actually cache annotations. So that's just file system cache. Uh, what we have been doing here is two lookups and the same ones I showed earlier on the slide. So there is a lookup to the page index, it's a lookup to which tags it has, and then a lookup to all if any has been expired. Um, questions so far? No, we can take it at the end. So if I go into the back end now, and try to edit something. Hopefully, some nothing should happen. So we just add a number here, um, and we save the changes. Go back to the post list. So here in the back end, it's it's fine. There is no cache there, so it's look coming up immediately. If we go here, hopefully it should not be cleared, and it's not. So we see the title is the same. So actually, right now I need to. Um, I need to clear the cache manually. So there is the um, cache um, pool clear command at the bottom there, maybe to load to see. So um, cache pool has things like listing the pools, clearing the pool. Actually, if we can have a look. So clear, delete, list, prune. Um, prune is about deleting expired items, so freeing up disk space or whatever needed, uh, if the adapter supports it. Listing, listing the pools, uh, delete, um, I guess it's a deleting uh, item itself. And clearing is clearing everything. So in this case, if we do clear, cache app, and hope I didn't do any typos, we should have now the thing coming up here, 
And we can also see that now it started with a clean, clean slate, no cache at all. There is four database lookups. We refresh, it's back to this. So next step of uh, business here is that we need to clear when there is uh, admin involved. So in this case, it's the admin controller, admin slash blog, blog controller we update. We can see a uh, recurring thing here. We add the tag uh, cache interface. We add that to a couple of methods. Specifically, speci specifically we need to do it in two cases. Um, when we add a new blog, we need to clear the whole index. Um, because we, we basically add an item to the collection, or however you want to phrase it. So what we do is, uh, there is a tag called blog post list. Uh, we just have to clear that. And that will clear all the different lists. We don't know which page this will, or we could guess it's ending up on page one, but it, it should also pay, end up on category pages and so on. So we just clear all in this case. There is also the case when we edit a post where we need to clear cache. So in this case, there is a second tag called blog post and then the ID. So in this case, we actually only clear the pages where this blog post appears. The other ones are not affected. So those stay uh, cached. Those affected gets cleared. It should now work. So if we now uh, try to do the same, and hopefully this should work. Yeah, so if you go here, change this further, to something very creative. Um, we save it, we see it shows up, and now it also shows up on the front page. So that's it uh, on, on the Symfony cache use itself. But right now we used the file system cache actually. So we might want to actually move a bit further. Yeah. Yes, but if I refresh, there is one. It, there was four because the cache was cleared, so it needed to create them again. So um, it's the... Um, it's the... Um, yeah, I, I mean, maybe I misunderstood. I, I thought that was on the front end size side, the f one query for blog post, not one uh, find all. I mean. Oh, okay, yeah. No, the the one um, is because I'm logged in and the Symfony demo is loading the user. Yeah. So the the three above one is done here on find latest by the, um, the SQL code going on there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and if there was a category, there would be at least another one coming from this one. So specifically, there was not a hit. It needed to recreate it and save it. Uh, what I did not explain so far, and I need to do that before we move to Redis, is that as of um, for three, there was also introduction of an alternative way to deal with cache uh, that some might like better. So below here, we had the, the log if else logic on hit or not. And there's an alternative way. You can have a closure um, using the um, interface exposed by Symfony contracts. So this is not in any PSR um, in standards. And this is why I'm a bit reluctant to use it. But it's a very nice way of dealing with cache. It's much easier. So maybe it's preferred way in any kind of normal application. You have the closure for refreshing it whenever it's needed. So less logic here, less code. Um, you don't need to save. That's done by the data that is uh, stored. And actually, there is a few other features on this. You can also set. Um, it has additional uh, arguments here. So you can set something called beta, which means, uh, uh, yeah, that's a cache. Uh, uh, concept by itself, it, it invo Im involves uh, cache stamping, which means it uh, does some variation on when things should expire. So if you say it should expire in one minute, 
it might expire in 40 seconds or one. So never longer, but sometimes earlier to make sure you don't get a lot of cache hits at 60 seconds. If all your cache has been warmed up, all expire in 60, it spreads it out to make sure your, your system isn't hit by this. So uh, cache piling effect or dog piling effect, there's a lot of names for this. So uh, this could be useful, but back to Redis. So, Uh, no. Nope. Yeah, so I needed to switch to Symphony 4 here for cache actually, um, but that's not really the important part. What I did do is um, define a um, taggable adapter. I can open that file in PHP Storm instead. I defined a taggable adapter using the um, new Redis tagware adapter. And just reusing everything defined on the existing adapter, so parent here, and that's it. And then I, at the top here, I enable it. So now we should have a small look at Redis. So this is just Redis running in a container um, and should be reachable, hopefully. So right now, there is no keys in it. It's completely empty. Hopefully, if uh, Symphony agrees, no. Yeah, okay, I need to fix the things I... So, now we should be storing things in Redis. Um, it doesn't show up here because we just set it as a, uh, well, let's see. Did it actually store anything? No. So maybe I need to That's not really to blame here, but... Yeah, if it doesn't work, I'll just go skip to uh, the step where I show how this works in practice. But uh, it was just to show that the keys show up, so it's not really that important. But it would be good if it worked. Okay, so now, seems like something happened. No. Yeah, so it seems like it's picking up the wrong adapter. So let's move on to um, to um, rather look at how this uh, works. So what is going on underneath here? Uh, when <laughs> it would have used Redis is uh, it stores um, my key and some data on that. So in, in the case of adapter, it's a serialized PHP object. In this case, we just use plain text. Um, so that's okay. We now have... Uh, maybe there's something else going on. Hmm. Okay, so maybe the keys doesn't work here. Um, but, yeah. yeah, I didn't have to do that earlier today. Oh, okay. So it seems like it worked. So then we should be able to see that also if we 
clear the cache pool. And we run it again. We can see that it's only the one I created. So if I refresh, thanks, by the way. <laughs> so um, yeah, we can have a look at uh, the content here while we have that. So this one, um, get. Yeah, so you see here what it stores in the cache itself is, the, as usual, the serialized PHP object or IG binary kind of uh, content, if that's uh, configured. Um, but back to then uh, looking a bit on how this is stored. So we had um, we had the my key, no, yeah, M key. which contains data. On top of that, there is a set. So in this case, there is a S add being done against a similar thing. And maybe we say some tag. If we now do keys, we can see it's here. Uh, we can ask for using the commands to the set. There's a lot of S. Um, commands. So S members to show all the members. If we add another member, not the most creative values there, sorry about that. We then have two. Um, so this is kind of how it's, it's going on. Um, it stores the, the, the tags or the keys inside a tag and can look it up in case of invalidation. So talking a bit about invalidation, basically what's going on is it first does a rename. Uh, I'm not sure that will work here, but we'll see. New name, uh, M key, and then it does something a bit funky. Let's see if it actually works, but no. Well, that was wrong. Yep. So what this is doing, if you remember earlier, I talked about, yeah, I didn't like that. Yeah, I do. So what this is doing, or the original one, uh, which was supposed to be like this, uh, what this is doing is renaming the M key to M key um, plus hash. So the things around it is ignored. It, it will, it has a special meaning in cluster. So what uh, the adapter is doing, it makes sure uh, when we give this to Redis, we force it to use the same node as this one. So to avoid the issue where it would end up being renamed from one node to another, we tell it use the same node, and then specifically we add a random uh, generated uh, unique thing on top. So we rename it to something unique. So now the original uh, set is lost or removed from all nodes. It's kind of cleared, and we can start to work on it without any inference from other processes. Um, once we've done that, we can read the, the members again. OK. <laughs> um, I might have been moving the wrong one. But basically, in short, we read the members, and then in the end, we delete the keys. So we delete the members we got plus the tag. So by, by doing that, we cleared all the cache affected and, and the tag. Any questions on this? There is, um, in uh, current 4.3, there is a little bit different um, logic, actually. It's called SPOP. In this case, it doesn't work on that key, but SPOP is just popping out up to X amount of members 
just removing it from the set and returning it. Um, this is also kind of atomic, but um, yeah, it has limits in terms of having to deal with all in one go. So that's it on uh, Redis. Going a bit back here, I talked about edge cases, things to look out for. So there are two hard things in computer science, cache inhalation and things in off by one hour. Uh, we all seen this, I guess. And well, it's kind of true. Uh, the thing to be aware of is um, uh, race conditions, for instance. Uh, when you're dealing with cache um, or anything in terms of um, <laughs> Yeah, when, when you act on some data, you load and then you do something on that. There can be a race in, in between. So the same is with cache. If you if you need, in our case, uh, we had a bug where we uh, were loading which current version is the right version of the content first, and then we loaded that content. Um, in between there, a uh, few times a year, some customers of us had then the wrong version uh, being loaded. So it can happen. There's a, some time delay, there's some computation happening. So there's a race. When you cache data, there's also transactions to take into account. If you, if you, do, if you have a back-end application that needs to do transactions and do a lot of things during that transactions, you cannot really update the cache during that phase because the, your data is not available to the other uh, processes yet. So you need to kind of hold back those changes and when the transaction happens, you flush it out or kind of clear everything affected. Um, besides that, there's also async, stale issues. If you deal with uh, stale uh, cache, which is maybe more common with varnish and stuff like that, you will either run into issue or just live with it <laughs> because you know there it will be there. Like in varnish, you, you, buy, you specifically ask it to give stale content for a brief time because you don't want a big hit on your, your server. But with this kind of data, when you st store data, uh, when you cache your data yeah, and your code will act on it, you really don't want stale data. So in this case, I would avoid it by all costs if you act on the data being loaded from cache. Um, the Redis tag aware adapter right now, the sets never expire, as I mentioned. That can be an issue because it can grow and take up a lot of uh, memory especially if you have a lot of tags, and those are maybe never or very um, seldomly expired. So that's it. Hope um, that was helpful. Any questions, any things?